Катя. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely pleased to be here this evening with you to talk about this uh, topic, which is going to be responsible finance, uh, which I think uh, touches uh, now lots of uh, people, given especially the, uh, the wake of the financial crisis and uh, the kind of observations that uh, we can make, namely that uh, over the uh, last 10 years we had like uh, two different uh, bubbles that exploded. But I will have to cast uh, responsible finance in a uh, more broader context. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, also uh, to present uh, Ashesay. Ashesay is uh, celebrating its uh, 100th uh, birthday anniversary this year. It's a great lady that uh, has uh, evolved, moved over the time. She is still in fantastic shape. Uh, and uh, she's also moving over the time and uh, adapting to uh, new ideas, exactly like uh, responsible learning for responsible leading, which is now our slogan at um, Ashesay. So, I'm going to articulate uh, my talk in uh, two different parts. Um, the first uh, part uh, is going to be responsible finance. What is this? What is this? Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, have to actually put uh, responsible finance in a more broader context uh, to explain what it is, how to get uh, at it. Uh, and uh, the second part, then, part two, is uh, what are the kind of mechanisms that uh, we have at our disposition to make sure that uh, financial markets and markets in general, and going to put way more emphasis in general than just on banks, the question is how to get it done. And there's also going to be like an implicit third part is ongoing to letting you know, know uh, how things uh, evolved uh, from uh, Asher And I would like to also take uh, one second to say hello to some of uh, my former students uh, and in general to my friends. Um, my wife is also in the audience uh, and also to say hello to all of you. <laughs> hello. Hello. Very shy. hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, this was much better. So, in terms of uh, speaker, I was asked to introduce myself. So, here it is. You can now imagine that you have this professor who talks about responsible finance, and one of the ideas that could come to mind is one more uh, alternative type of greenish guy. The thing is, actually, before becoming a citizen, I was born in Bavaria, and Bavaria is known for its traditional values. This being said, exactly like we have here black and some green, I think that uh, green spots with black actually fit extremely well together, and there's no contradiction. So I don't believe that I'm a dreamer. I believe that uh, free markets should be what they are. I believe also that things have gone now a little bit out of hand, and maybe it's time now to put uh, uh, things back in your hand. And what I'm actually doing here is uh, holding a financial engineering class. I teach those mean things like how to price derivatives that are then going to be put in structured products that can be used then to reap uh, money from, uh, from the ignorant uh, investors. <laughs> But here what I'm actually doing is teaching what is uh, called the market to market, which is a mechanism to make sure that uh, companies uh, are going to put, uh, when they play in those derivative assets, going to put uh, margins, and then this is like a guarantee to make sure that uh, when there is going to be a probability of default, it's going to be no relatively soon. So this is, I think, the way it should be done when we talk about uh, responsible finance. What you <coughs> teach should be uh, also in terms of the teaching that uh, we do. So let me now go to the big picture and introduce uh, some of the, the key concepts. So the key concept that is like encompassing responsible finance uh, is uh, what is called a CSR. This stands for Corporate Social Responsibility. We're going to see over the next uh, few minutes there are going to be lots of definitions to cast then the, uh, the, the setting in which uh, things go on. And so what is actually uh, uh, corp um, responsible uh, corporate, uh, social responsibility? It is that uh, firms are creating now what is called externalities. So you can have good externalities. That's, for instance, when you have a road that is going to lead to a company, and this road can be then used also by other people. But also you're going to have negative externalities. And the thing is, we really care about the negative stuff. It is when you're going to have pollution, when you need to, to destroy forests for then getting wood. And so we need to be careful about this. 
And I think, and this is now uh, my green part, uh, I think that in terms of the management, there are lots of points where over the past, I talked about bubbles, where things could uh, left a little margin for improvement. Okay? There was one example, which is Enron, where you had uh, people doing manifest fraud. Uh, the uh, CEO is still now smoldering in prison for like six, six years, which is just for scanning. also. Then we had a few banks, this is long, I stopped, uh, I stopped at some point, we have Glitnir, this is uh, from Iceland, Lehman, uh, Bearings, this was one of the first uh, big chapters uh, where a bank actually was becoming bankrupt because you have a rogue trader. And then, uh, well, uh, you have had in the United States and all other elsewhere also a huge strand of uh, neoliberal thoughts, uh, starting with uh, somebody called uh, Milton Friedman, and this gentleman here, Alan Greenspan, he was then promoting then this thought of neoliberalism also, and it was then adopted by the government. And lots of the consequences that we are facing now in terms of the crash, I think can be uh, traced back to uh, what uh, actually was done then in terms of policy at the, the central bank level from America. He was the one who uh, actually led the, was responsible for the subprime crisis. We also have uh, non-bank uh, problems, namely we have Union Carbide India Limited, uh, you might have forgotten, but a few years ago we had Bhopal in India, and this is the company. They also have uh, some Swiss company here that had a subsidiary, which had a subsidiary, that had a subsidiary that eventually owned a company that was placed in Seveso. And again, we know that this uh, led down to some disastrous things. So my belief is that uh, we have seen in the past uh, bad things happening and what can be done now to, to make sure that this is not going to repeat uh, so quickly. The responsible finance now, it is the subgroup of, the, uh, of corporate social responsibility that focuses actually on companies having now sound financial objectives. We believe that uh, uh, sustainability, the fact that companies are going to endure, this is fundamental but that the cash and the profit is not the only thing. Namely, that other things are going to matter, social aspects are going to matter, environmental aspects, ethics, and corporate governance. And these are now the, uh, the three or the four things uh, that uh, I will um, uh, talk about. And the funny thing is you have lots of acronyms in this uh, literature. We're going to talk about SRI, which is Social Responsible Investment. Then you have CSR, then you have something that is called C, so C is when you care about social, environmental, and ethic aspects. Then you have ESG, that's environmental. Then you have uh, social and SEEK. But nobody ever talked about SEEK. So maybe one should create SEEK, where actually you care about the fourth thing. But the problem is it takes four letters to do this. So, so let me now talk about those four points that I mentioned, and let me elaborate a little bit on this. So we have ethics, of course. And at some point, when we talk about responsible finance, the issue is also going to be the metric. How do we establish standards? And to show you that this is something extremely difficult, we need to talk a little bit about some of the, those aspects uh, that we are discussing here. Namely, uh, law is uh, something that is well known in established rules when you drive the car. Then if you have a car that comes from the right, you should let the car then go in front of you. It's very good that we have such laws. These are what you can call them hard laws. But we also have then uh, other aspects that go beyond the law, which is going to be ethics. Ethics is extremely difficult to measure. That's why it's a branch of philosophy. And you have this gentleman here who a long time ago, about 350 before Christ, he was actually thinking about good and bad. His name, his name is Socrates. And if you read a book on medicine, you will also see that this picture emerges. I would like to give you a case. This case was uh, told to me by a gentleman coming from the Chartered Financial Analysts Association. This is the CFA. I should say the Zanga program part of the CFA. Meaning that if you form your studies at the Lausanne, you're extremely well prepared to take them this exam. One of the things that happens with the CFA is that a huge load of uh, the uh, program consists in uh, knowing uh, things about ethics. And so this guy, Michael Miller, told me about this real case, real life case that I would like to read with you. So you're being told by your boss, his name is Jeff Jefferson, to make copies of all the recent marketing material that he created. Very productive in creating material. And he has also been told that Jeff, who trained you, so I've been trained by Jeff, for the last three years, that's the training that you got, will be laid off at the end of the month. 
now you have several choices. A, you perform the copies. You tell Jeff that you can't take the copies. You may just, uh, you know, the bad news, uh, you do some of the copies in between. Well, what's the law? What do you do? Question to you. What do you do? It's harder, isn't it? Um, so we have certain principles like, uh, you know, shareholder value maximization. And one of my students, when Michael was talking about uh, this case, was saying, well, the thing is, my boss doesn't really care about me. Now, if I, uh, if I uh, try to do some shareholder maximization, is this really going to help me, given the incentive structure that I have? So uh, I don't care. I just take the copies. At the same time, this is going to hurt the copies. So somehow you should feel guilty. The thing is, this is where ethics comes in. It, it has to do now with things that are, for which there's no real law. And, and you still you need to decide. And now, if I'm an outsider, if I need to monitor now a company, and I need to make judgments concerning the ethics that is being done inside of the company, I'm going to be permanently faced with decisions that need to be taken for which there is no law. But however, somehow the management needs to decide. And how do we, as a rating agency or whatever, decide on those things? To tell me the answer of what happened here, the, the employee, he, uh, he had a team spirit, he made the copies, but then at the same time he was talking to his management. And he said, listen, Jeff told me that I should make those copies. I could not make them. He trained me. I had the responsibility because still he's my boss. Uh, but I would like to, to know that actually he's the boss. Uh, that uh, he, he asked me to do so. The management was unhappy, but uh, they uh, accepted this. Uh, and they were very happy, nonetheless, that uh, Jeff... Uh, um, uh, the, 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 the guy who um, made them the copies actually told them. And this is very often then the case, of, this is for you, if you have a mor moral problem, talk to other people, share what you have in terms of problem, and this is then something that uh, can help you then to, to, sell, to, to save your life. Another example here, totally woman. So the slogan, I took it from an existing Swiss company, so it produces dresses that are appealing to young girls and young women, Dishes here come to, from a country which is the third uh, poorest, uh, according to about all the statistics that you have. It's uh, Burundi, and the capital is Kitega. Okay, and this company now employs kids, and, and the work conditions no way then would be accepted in Switzerland. So now you, the purchaser of those uh, products, now you have the choices between A and B. So you don't care as long as the prices are cheaper. We just product now you boycott those products. What do you do? The thing is, now you need to cast this in the overall setting. And at face value, if you have read this slide, uh, and if you had any hesitation not to boycott this product, there's a problem. You should think twice. I would have boycotted immediately. And if you hesitated, think twice. But now I'm going to tell you an additional story. And this additional story here it now has to do with what is generally known sustainability, or durable, economy durable, as it's called in French. And I tell you now that totally woman, uh, uh, woman also, for all the under 18 uh, employees, they uh, provide now uh, several hours of training per week. Uh, they give uh, free meals and they have excellent health care. And so those kids that otherwise may be dying, because of this, they're going to get food and supply. So again, we see that. The first thing I would have thought, my God, panic. But if I read this in addition, I now understand that I'm going to have to fill a grid with lots of different criteria. Before it was easy. We only had cash and tried to maximize shareholder value, one, one objective, and it's measurable in terms of dollars. Here I have lots of additional things in terms of measurements. Still, I have dollars. I would like my company to be sustainable to last in the future. But then, at the same time, there are lots of other things coming in. Namely, I'm doing good here for, for, for people, for society. And how do I measure this? Can I measure it in terms of people that I saved from starving? I don't know. We have other topics. This is Giorgi Gandikas, uh, who did um, uh, great things. Uh, depends on from which, if you, uh, if you view it from a company side or from the Oran side, uh, actually did great things for the Orans. They are very grateful to this lady. And here the, the message is that uh, at some point uh, you had uh, the uh, Borneo government who thought to construct uh, a uh, park. Uh, and uh, Birote uh, Gadikas, she's a German woman uh, from birth, uh, at the beginning then uh, when the, you had this initiative of having then this uh, park, uh, she stood up, she moved uh, the world, so to speak, and in the end then it turns out that uh, this park was not constructed. So the message is that uh, 
one person alone sometimes can be sufficient uh, to also change lots of things. So it's not because uh, you believe that uh, something is unfair, but there's nothing that can't be done. You can do something. Okay. Then back and so forward. The last corporate governance. This is a topic about which so much uh, has been written, but uh, I'm not going to be uh, insisting on it. Uh, this is normally the, the, the basis uh, when you do a corporate finance course or when you go uh, to an MBA class 101. You're being told that there's going to be a separation between ownership and control. You're going to have the shareholders who want to have a maximization of money. You're going to have then the management. The management uh, can behave in a nasty, mean way. They can have corporate jets. They can have a um, uh, nice, uh, plush uh, office. Uh, and they can then uh, divert um, uh, shareholder value uh, as an additional compensation for themselves and this has led to this huge strand of literature on uh, contract theory about which uh, I'm not going to, to elaborate but it definitely also matters. Now out of all this, uh, this corporate governance uh, theme has emerged now a new theme which is the stakeholder uh, theme and uh, as of today when I go to some presentations of my colleagues from management that I should say they wouldn't talk about shareholders, but they all the time talk about stakeholders. So the first time when I heard about stakeholders, I was thinking stakeholders. Is this a new instrument somehow to cook uh, your barbecue steak? I think you write it in the same way. No, you write it differently, but the pronunciation, it's one of the tricky things in English, is uh, the spelling is different, fortunately. So stakeholders, these are individuals that are somehow concerned by the activities of the company. They're going to be affected. And normally, in traditional corporate finance, these people are completely left out. Okay? So what are our uh, uh, stakeholders in general? These are, can be now individuals uh, that are going to be, uh, for instance, employed by the company. This was exactly like we said before, the employee relation. You can have uh, health care that we provide to our employees. There can be some profit sharing in certain cases. And I have been to, to companies. At the end of the year, then the manager he took out of the company huge amounts uh, for his own wager, uh, whereas the employees got, uh, got, got nothing. And actually, at the end, uh, the, the, the end of the year, the, uh, the profit and loss uh, statement was then negative because the manager paid himself so much money. This is not really good then for the, for the employee relation. And, uh, I could feel re rebellion when I was in that company. You have community services, so community services are also very important. You can provide housing then for people. Uh, you're going to have aspects uh, such as uh, diversity, you can care about uh, their, uh, uh, gender and race also. Environment, uh, human rights, and you can think about, uh, for instance, what does a company, uh, with respect to governments, does a company now provide uh, to certain political parties lots of money or not? Or does it provide money like Enron did to all the parties that exist in the United States to, to make sure that whatever would happen in that case it's going to be uh, hedged. We can be concerned about also products. We're going to have all sorts of different products uh, and uh, we can ask ourselves if we put some money in a, uh, uh, in a company, now uh, do we like the product or would we like now to, uh, to have uh, discrimination of the products. So this concludes now my first part. Uh, let me now talk about the second part, uh, responsible finance, how to get it done. And so one answer is arm twisting, but it comes immediately also with a question. So let me uh, elaborate now on this notion of arm twisting and uh, also on um, the question mark. So it seems actually that you're going to have some managers, uh, and I believe also in this notion of managers, uh, my father used to be a manager, and uh, I know how much uh, he was actually involved with uh, his employees when he uh, had difficult negotiations with unions, he came home, he was sick. Uh, and so, you know, as a good manager, I think uh, you are really feeling responsible. When I, when I started my PhD, uh, uh, this was in America, in a good, well-known uh, university in Boston, starting with H, uh, a business school, uh, in the account department, and actually, uh, the first of course that I was taught was one of corporate finance and what I was taught on the first day was how do you dismantle a company and how to make it more profitable. So you take over a company, you dismantle, fire everybody, outsource this and that and that. And I was really shocked because I was having completely different values coming from Europe. 
Okay, so some managers, I truly believe that uh, they do really, uh, they feel responsible for, for, um, for what they are doing, and this is something that should be uh, recognized and be greeted. But we also have uh, some other managers, uh, and the examples before we have seen, uh, there's something uh, definitely went uh, then wrong. Now there's uh, the yin and the yang, the good and the bad, and this is uh, the virtue and the, 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 uh, the mean and the, the vicious. Here I consider two different channels, the direct channel and the indirect channel, how you can influence uh, a people's behavior. So the direct channel, I'm going to talk lots about this, and this is when the, uh, you're going to have certain individuals called in investment funds, or you're going to have the government, or you're going to have you know, some um, uh, individuals on their own, like Bureau team, who are going to somehow affect the decision uh, of the company. This is one way. And the indirect channel, which is where you have way fewer examples, is when the corporation is going to behave in a responsible manner, but uh, because somehow it's for the bad motives, if you want, it's going to be concerned about financial motives. So let me give an example of when we're going to have like responsible finance occurring in a natural way, the indirect channel. Suppose that you're working in a company and you always see that in the night, the light is turning. You would like that the employees, when they leave their office, are going to turn off the light in the evening. The first way of saying is, if you don't turn off the light, I'm going to punish you. Okay? I'm going to uh, then somehow take uh, five money, five uh, Swiss francs from you. So first of all, the, the employees are going to think this is not enforceable, so it's not criminal. Now, the second way that actually you can convince those people, and this is where you can use social responsible arguments, that is when you tell to them, listen, each second and each minute that you leave the, the light turned on, what is going to happen is that you're going to produce CO2, you're going to have a negative impact on the environment, and many people then would actually start thinking and say, yes, maybe it's actually good if I turn, on the, turn off the light then as I leave the office. That, yes, no, maybe you do. I think most people would do. And here we're exactly in the behavioral economics, which I think is playing a, a very important role in this type of dimension. But let me talk more about the direct uh, channels that uh, I mentioned. So the first uh, one is the, uh, the role of the government. Uh, and um, for instance, it was uh, concerning the uh, CO2. Only after the uh, European Union imposed uh, uh, CO2 trading schemes that actually money could be put, put on uh, then the pollution and that this got then internalized then in uh, the, uh, some of the, um, the, the budgets and uh, profit and loss statements, uh, uh, the balance sheets of the companies. So this was one way. Then the regulation of financial institutions, here I'm talking about what happened before 2007, with this uh, extreme neoliberal current that you had, and uh, I think it has been a complete failure, of course, we have uh, I mean, lots of people from you come, well, you come from banks, you know how all this developed with the, the CDOs, with the, uh, um, the, the products that were developed for the mortgage market, where one would put different mortgages together, and you essentially had then a, a Japanese person who could uh, buy a diversified portfolio of uh, some housing projects that were somewhere, somewhere down in Alaska for the Eskimos. And uh, in between, you had uh, lots of different uh, uh, structures in between, and in the end, there was complete opacity. You had no clue who owned what. And then, on top of this, we added so called CDSs. CDSs, these are like insurances, and uh, we were then insuring certain uh, those products, and nobody really had a value. And then, as things go back, it was then a cascade. CDOs failed, uh, there was no money then for the insurance, uh, and um, yes, 2007, 2008. As a reaction to this, uh, I uh, see uh, what I believe are good signs now at the horizon. Here you have uh, President Obama, who is with uh, Senators Dodd and uh, Frank. And right after the financial crisis, these gentlemen sat together and they wrote like a 1,000 page report on laws or modifications say, of the way that the current system works. And I can see now this starts kicking in. You have had milestones, you see that uh, you're going to have the trades of derivatives like swaps, uh, like other products that are being channeled, so so-called swap exchange facility, the SAFSOM, which are then <coughs> themselves uh, uh, cleared by central clearing platform, CCPs, again, lots of things in three letters, 
uh, SEFs uh, and CCPs and, and all these are things that I see now to, to emerge in the dot uh, in the bank of the dot frag act and I think this is definitely the good direction to go. I was talking about also the red mechanism that you can invest in a social responsible investment. Um, these are going to be mutual funds that are going to target specifically then companies that uh, are behaving in a corporate uh, responsible way where of course as I showed the metrics according to which we're going to calibrate is going to be very difficult. This is for the uh, United States market and I got my data from this uh, source here. And what you have here, it doesn't matter if you look at the left or the right scale, and, uh, once it's going to be in, in terms of number of funds, that's the blue curve here, what you see is that over the last uh, 10, 15 years, between 1995 here and 2010, the number of social responsible funds has increased in terms of number. You have had an increase also in terms of the uh, money that uh, they have under management, but at the same time, if you look at uh, the overall picture, Worldwide, uh, sorry, in Europe, uh, in uh, 1999 and 2000, it's this amount that you have uh, money that was actually in Europe under social responsible management. Nothing, peanuts. Not even a peanut, half a peanut. <laughs> United States, from that point uh, of view, have been uh, more uh, developed, if I may say. Uh, has been um, already 9% of the money under mandate in 1995 which was uh, socially responsible invested, uh, it increased uh, to about uh, 12, 10% to 2000 and has been stagnating, say, at uh, these uh, figures here ever since 2000, so very stable, okay? And the cynical thing is, there's a study that I found that dealt with the Dutch market and actually uh, was found that stakeholders, they don't really care about uh, environment, so this seems to go then uh, in the, the right uh, direction. Okay, so also that banks, uh, they can decide where to put their money in, so you don't need to have social responsible funds. Banks play a huge responsibility when they give a credit, uh, and I think uh, even though they might not get direct credit in the, uh, in the philosophical sense, they might get, uh, when they give a credit in the money sense, they may do good when they are very careful about uh, where they invest. Do we really want to lend to this and that company that produces weapons that are going to kill other people? Okay, my personal point of view at some point well, with respect uh, to sustainable, uh, uh, with respect to responsible uh, finance and uh, sustainable investment here was that this crap, it's optimization and the constraint doesn't work. Uh, this was my dark side uh, from Bavaria. And then I downloaded uh, from uh, Dow Jones, uh, and this is also what I heard from hearsay, the uh, sustainable world indices from Dow Jones and the total world index, that's the red index. Uh, and I have the black index here, which is a sustainable world. And what you see is that uh, in terms of money that you would have gotten here, 100, you would have gotten more money here by uh, whatever it is, uh, if you had uh, put uh, investment in sustainable, and it essentially remained above the uh, global portfolio if you uh, had um, then invested in sustainable. Now that there are other studies that go exactly, academic studies in this direction. It is not because you invest in sustainable investments that you're going to be punished. Okay, it's not going to, to cost you anything. The general question could be, why actually should I get penalized if I invest now in something that is uh, sustainable? So let's proceed now by the opposite. <laughs> let's talk about sin stocks, sin stocks. Sin stocks are those stocks where the companies would be investing now in bad things. Okay? Bad things, for instance, are alcohol, or could be tobacco, and uh, it's considered to be gaming. And I'm talking here about a paper by Harrison Hong and Marcin Kasperczyk, which was published yesterday, almost. Uh, they didn't look at the axe industry, they don't talk about drugs simply because they don't have data, and they didn't talk about weapons because they said that for some countries, actually, weapons are good. Take the example of US. Okay? If you have a weapons company that produces gun, everybody says, uh, take Eastwood, this is good. So they focused on uh, these three companies here. And their thought was that, okay, we're going to have now the, those companies and we're going to have now have lots of people who don't want to put their money into those companies. Why not? Well, because if you're a pension fund, a pension fund is relatively transparent. You have to publish the companies that you hold and so you become transparent. And if you hold those companies, it might be then a bad signal. So 
this is going to be then the first type of constraint. Uh, and me personally, if I'm going to put my money in uh, just anywhere, I might ask myself, do I really would like to, to put my money now into, into weapons or uh, weapon companies? And I guess personally, I, I wouldn't do this. So in other words, you're going to have now a reduction in terms of the amount of people who are going to invest in such uh, financial investments. This is going to decrease liquidity. Uh, and whenever you're going to have less liquidity, something that nobody has understood before 2007, the notion of liquidity, now we talk about it. But if you're going to have less liquidity, you should get a compensation for this. And it turns out that those guys have found that if you have now those SIN stocks, actually you get a higher earning now, an average of about 2.5%. To take exactly into this, account, this fact into account that if you are in a company that is a sinner, you're going to have to apply a higher hurdle rate to get the capital to then actually perform the investment. Okay? The question now is, um, can be something learned about this now for, for, uh, for responsible investment? Okay? Here I'm talking about uh, the center. Go ahead. I'm not there yet. Boom. Back, 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 back. Uh, okay, when I'm talking here about the sinners, is there something else that would justify now abnormal returns for sustainable investment, for companies that do good? So now you need to think, what is it actually, I see finance theory now, that is going to generate like abnormal returns? It would be that we are going to have now abnormal surprises, okay? Surprise, abnormal surprise. This is a little bit too much, just surprises. Okay? So when you have surprises, but in that case, you're going to get a, a strong stock market reaction. This is then actually going to be what is going to be uh, then driving the abnormal returns. Otherwise, it's business as usual. I'm talking here about controlling for all the different risks, like size, like book to market, all those uh, corporate, uh, uh, like those asset pricing variables for those who are specialists uh, that uh, you would like to, to measure them, to use them to measure risks. So all these here are then. Uh, uh, Constraints that you have on one side for the, those companies, for uh, SIN stocks, but you don't find the same constraints, uh, of course, for uh, um, uh, social responsibility. <laughs> and what explains uh, the abnormal returns then for social responsibility is that, yes, if you behave like a good guy today, in the future you're going to have then also a good surprise. In that case, because uh, you do something today that you have no idea that actually would happen, it comes to a surprise to you, but also to the others, then in that case, you get some of this abnormal return that I was just showing then for, the, uh, for those uh, curves uh, that uh, showed that uh, uh, on, ab on, uh, on average, you're going to then have uh, the uh, uh, social responsible investment that did quite well. Another research uh, that is not exactly responsible finance, but has to do with corporate social responsibility, this is uh, now dealing with um, reputational damage. One thing that you need to consider also is when you run a company, is the potential of you doing something that is going to be at some point considered damageable to ethics, to society, to environment, to all the criteria that we were talking about before. Okay? So if you're a manager and you're not careful about what you're going to be doing now, at some point it is possible that you're going to attract attention, you're going to be sued. Exactly like a few years ago when you were based in the United States, it was very important for you to take care about risk management because you could get sued. It's also that uh, depending on what you do now, if you do something that is going to be found from a legal point of view that to be bad, in that case actually you can then have huge damages that uh, are then actually a, a, a penalty. So what you need to do is think long term. Uh, it's very important to do this because otherwise you can get bad surprises here uh, from the point of view uh, law. So these gentlemen here, Arnold Meyer and uh, Polo, in a study, they looked at hundreds of different uh, companies that somehow got uh, in trouble with uh, the uh, United Kingdom, with the regulator. And then uh, they computed a measure for reputational loss. So this was the change in the stock value as you had then the announcement that uh, the company was actually being sued, and then they subtracted from this uh, the fine that uh, you had uh, to pay. So the corporation was one uh, million dollars, for instance, and the fine uh, would be now 100,000. In that case, uh, the loss is not uh, just uh, 100,000, the loss is a multiple of this. It's going to be maybe 500,000. So 100,000, that's what you pay for fine, 400,000, that's what you pay for reputational damage there. And so this is something that is big. 
Now, if you were cynical, you can say this is on the announcement, maybe in the longer run, like BP, if you look at BP's shares, when you had the, the, the platform in the Gulf of Mexico, a few days after, boom, <coughs> crashed, uh, six months later, exactly, it was the same level as before. So. Uh, but still keep this in the back of my mind, it might turn bad against you. Okay, let me erase and also my different slides. Um, uh, talking about the kind of research that is being done at the uh, Aschersee, um, last week I was in a, uh, presided a PhD committee where you had Sebastian Minard, he graduated uh, last week, and who was actually discussing something that is uh, called a uh, soft law initiative. A soft law initiative is uh, now a way also to exert in a certain way uh, pressure on companies, but uh, it could be the way that this pressure is going to be exercised in the future. And it's in a positive way. It's uh, not where you just say something, uh, do this and that in an authoritarian way. It's based on the dialogue. So let me give an example. Okay? Uh, the two examples that are displayed here, we have this uh, logo here, FSC. It corresponds uh, to an initiative that was taken as the Forest uh, Stewardship Council and uh, the objective of this uh, NGO, it's a non-governmental organization, not for profit, is actually to make sure that when a tree has been uh, cut, it's going to be replaced uh, somewhere. So they give themselves like uh, guides of color. <laughs> The soft, uh, soft law initiatives are uh, also sometimes called multi-stakeholder um, initiative. And one example that I started with actually now has to do with uh, the kids that uh, you exploit uh, in terms of work. And, and uh, in the apparel industry, those people who produce dresses like uh, Totally Woman, actually it turns out that uh, you have lots of cases, as I was mentioning about uh, the, uh, the kids that were working in uh, sweatshops under very bad conditions, and that there was no medical care. And so at some point, uh, you had uh, a movement that starts that created in 1999, then under the uh, inputs of President uh, Bill Clinton, there was like a getting together of on one side the government, non-governmental uh, um, organizations. You have the companies who got together, and also university, university movements, and so they all got together and they thought about: Is what we are doing really something that is good? Okay. There was not really a way that this could have been implemented in a governmental way because it was like a, a transnational problem. It had to do worldwide with worldwide, and uh, probably it was not the uh, you know the, the government uh, in Pakistan or Bangladesh uh, for uh, some of those companies that would have imposed that anything on the foreign company maybe because there's corruption and all the other things, and so it needed to be coming from somewhere else, and uh, so you had like three different phases. Of, where well, uh, this uh, initiative then uh, got implemented. First initiative was that the companies monitored themselves. Then the uh, second phase was we're going to have an external monitoring. And uh, the third phase was we're going to still have external monitoring, but we're also going to provide education and training to make sure that uh, what we actually do and preach uh, within our uh, uh, banks is actually the, the, the right thing. So I have spoken a long time. I gave you some short uh, examples of uh, of what uh, is a corporate uh, social responsibility. The next speaker is going to get into more details. At I should say, uh, there was some arm twisting also, actually two arms, I still feel some pain in the shoulders from uh, my colleague here. He wrote a book, uh, it is, I think, uh, reflecting our values that we have. It's interesting reading. And having said all this, I would like to thank you for your attention. <coughs> Michael, as I said before, we have a few minutes for questions and answers. So, is any one of you ready to jump into this question and answer small session? So, maybe I'll start so that you know, give you a little bit of courage. So, Mike, if you had to give one and only one advice to any of the stakeholders about how to go about responsible finance, what would you say? Well, talk as much as you can with other players in your field. I think this is the, the main message that um, I have uh, gotten uh, talking to uh, people such as, uh, for instance, Michael McMillan from the CFA Association. It's by communicating your intentions, what you plan to do, that you can then go to other companies 
when you then discuss uh, issues with other companies, so in the case of the apparel industry, uh, it happened that uh, you got uh, Nike, Puma, and all the uh, shoe companies, then they talked together, they saw that maybe this, what we had done so far was not a good thing. <laughs> uh, everybody then was jumping on the bandwagon when it was possible then to change that actually thing. So you need to have a momentum, and this is something that you can't get on your own. You need to have other people to help you. Uh, so with the example of the company Totally Boom that you were uh, mm -hmm. using, uh, you mentioned that you know uh, they're actually providing education to their workers because if they don't do that, consumers will boycott the company. No, I didn't say this. Uh, I said at the beginning, this lady who runs this company, I changed the name. She comes from Switzerland. Uh, she uh, actually uh, did the uh, hotel school in Lausanne. And she just uh, has a global view. She, she's a more generous person. And uh, so at the beginning, she, she had that moral values. And as she set up this company, at the same time, she also implemented then the uh, positions for health. The thing is, uh, some companies, they do now uh, corporate social responsible initiatives. They, do, they, they, they believe they do good things, but it's for the bad motives. The bad motive is that uh, you, do, uh, you do something to justify uh, somehow your actions because you believe that somebody, by looking over your shoulder, might do then the, the wrong thing. I think you really need to be convinced also to doing it. Then you're going to do it right. Otherwise, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be like when Switzerland tried to do good by bringing Swiss cows to Africa. They all died, those cows. It was just not the right place for the Swiss cows. You know, you need to sing in the evening to the Swiss cows. You need to clean them, wash them. And there, the, the, they had no food. Uh, there was lots of microbes and so no, uh, you, you not only need to ship the cows, you also need to sh ship all the medicines to keep those lives, uh, those cows alive. And this was not the case. So this is what I mean. So you good enough, question, not was, yes, yeah, my question was like, you know, what happens when uh, that moral obligation is not there on the company's part. Like there are uh, examples of you know really huge electronic companies that have been found to be using you know child labor in China. Sure. And no, they are right. selling like hotcakes, so there is no pressure on them from consumers. Uh, so how do you put that obligation? Into well, what you probably have in the back of your mind is uh, Fox Global, which uh, I think is yeah, the, the sure. usual so case of, yeah. with Apple. Yes, yeah, sir. So in the case of uh, Fox Global is actually working. So you need to have somebody who attracts then the attention to you know, something being bad. And this is where I think the corporate pain in the necks, as I call them, are quite useful. The corporate pain in the necks, these are the NGOs. It can be Amnesty International, it can be Greenpeace. Uh, not justifying any violence. I think anything that should be done is never on a violent basis. I'm personally absolutely against anything that has to do with violence. But I still believe that it's important that uh, we have alternative people who then look into what they really extremely careful <laughs> what is being done by the companies and what are the consequences of what they do. I don't have the time, but I think some people do have this, this time. Uh, professor, would it be possible or uh, would there be an opportunity where you and the UBS C CEO standing side by side sharing CSR with us? Why not? Um, yeah, that, that would be even better because you, you are academic, you know. We want to hear from the real practitioner that they also share the same philosophy as you. I'm glad to hear this. Um, Actually, we have decided to be politically correct. Yes. So, <laughs> so uh, but this is a possible discussion. Thank you. No, it's a huge uh, issue. I mean, with all the large companies that are we can, transnationals that are in different countries, I think it's an issue. Like the BS has had some difficulties. Uh, SK also at some point has had some difficulties. Well, almost all the companies that I know that are transnational, at one point or another, have had some difficulties. And some of them then dealt with the problems better than others. And so they need to be aware of this. There's a question, I think, over there. Yes, madam? Can you talk about um, companies which are uh, socially responsible and getting better results than others? Yes. Of, uh, um, 
I think it's a very complicated question. What can a, uh, an individual do within a company? And I think uh, you need to first of all have ethics. And you have, uh, also, if you work for a bank, you need to have uh, you need to have a uh, standard of, of values or that, uh, is ethics. Or, uh, I need to talk with the other people. You need to uh, if uh, you believe that something is wrong, do some whistleblowing. You have now this possibility of doing so. Again, I told you I'm personally absolutely against uh, violence, uh, so uh, I would not encourage uh, like uh, aggressive movement than fighting against uh, the, the company. I think uh, way more can be achieved by, by talking and trying than to, to, to talk and uh, then to, to get things being done. So you, you talked about Enron, right? Uh, yeah, Enron is a Yeah, okay, Enron, I mean, there you had the first case of whistleblowing of a lady who wrote then to the head management saying that uh, Kenneth Lay, who was then the, uh, the president of the board, that something wrong was really going on in terms of uh, Andrew Fasto putting all this money away into those uh, and, uh, and, uh, special purpose vehicles, brushing the money, that all the, the problems that they had on the carpet. And so the management uh, helped the board that they knew, but uh, it was never, then, never then anything was done. In the wake of this, you have had uh, changes now to uh, corporate, um, corporate governance. Uh, uh, I guess most of you, you know this, you have the possibility of whistleblowing, and uh, this is something that uh, you, you should not hesitate to do. If, if you personally believe as an individual that uh, you do something bad in that case, uh, I think uh, it falls on you. If we were talking now about UBS, my true conviction is that this poor guy from London, I don't know if you've seen a picture of him, he looks so miserable. Does he really look like you know, the jerk that uh, does bad things? I think for me, he started with a small little amount of money that uh, he lost somehow, and then he started to pay bigger money amounts like Nick Leeson also in uh, Singapore at some point did with the Bearings Bank, and then the problem built up, uh, built up, became bigger, and at some point became completely out of the hand. And so if in the first place he had talked to the other people, he might have gotten fired, but he might not be in this position as he is now, that's the first thing. And the second, thing is that in the end, it always, uh, if you, there's something that is wrong, it falls on the individual. So if you don't stand up to your values in the long run, you can believe that somehow you're going to be also punished because the management is going to throw you out. So always stick up to your values. I think that's the, 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 me the message that I can say. So if you believe in something, stand up and talk about it. I think it's an excellent message.